Welcome to this episode of the Catechetical Corner, Handing on and Defending the Faith. The Catholic faith is not a series of teachings that remain isolated and alone from one another. Everything Christ revealed in divine revelation is organically connected, and nothing illustrates this better than the relationship between Jesus and Mary. Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the Church, evolving out of the Second Vatican Council, states this truth very well. For Mary, who has entered deeply into the history of salvation, in a certain way unites within herself the greatest truths of the faith and echoes them. And when she is preached about and honored, she calls believers to her son, to his sacrifice, and to the love of the Father. In this episode, Father John Joseph, priest of the Diocese of Lafayette, will offer a reflection on three unique attributes exhibited by Mary that are often overshadowed by the traditional focus we have for her each year during the season of Advent. Again, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made, to fill the hearts which thou hast made. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. For in her there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety, all-powerful, overseeing all and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and most subtle. For wisdom is more mobile than any motion. Because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. For she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for Saint Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whenever we go to weddings, I think we all have, there's a similar experience when we go to a wedding. It's obvious what the main event is really kind of leading up to, what is kind of the climax of the wedding, or really at the very beginning, I should say, of the wedding. The wedding processions come on, and then all of a sudden it stops, the music changes, the doors open, and, you know, trumpets, violins, here comes the bride. It's kind of the climax of the whole wedding procession. And she's really the one who the day is, is all about. I mean, it's her day. And her, her, the white dress that she wears is, 
symbolic. I mean, it's, it's meant to be radiant. The whole idea of hiding her is that she's getting prepared to meet her husband. And the radiant white dress is symbolic of her own virginity. That's actually the symbolism behind that because, I don't know if you, I mean, I'm sure many of y'all know this, that if a woman gets married a, a second time, if she's in a second marriage, usually she doesn't wear white because the purity was, was meant to be represented by the all-white dress. And so in every wedding, the bride is the one who steals the show. And as it should be, it's her day. Now, so we've got this example of virginity, an example of purity, an example of being prepared to meet her husband. But there's another kind of woman that often tends to steal the show, and that's pregnant women. Pregnant women, you know, pregnancy glow, is a, it's a real effect. It's a scientific thing. It's, it's hormones that causes this sebum or something to make the face shine and make her grow flush. And then she actually uh, has pheromones that causes people to want to protect her. That's just, it, it's just what happens. And so whenever a woman is pregnant, people are just drawn to her. And it's, it's funny. It's like you can, you can tell even before the woman, you know, lets out the news, a lot of times, I, I've done this several times, put my foot in my mouth, where I've asked a woman if she was, or when, when, she, when they were having a baby or something, and she's like, oh, my gosh, nobody knows. You know? I was like, oops, I'm sorry, I won't tell anybody. That happened to me a couple of times. But there's something about a woman who's pregnant. I mean, there's a, she just she kind of exhibits it, even if she's not showing yet. And, of course, Advent, in its essence, what it's really about is, is about the great wedding, the wedding of God and humanity. When God and humankind become one in the flesh of Jesus Christ. It's the, and this is the great wedding. But of course, Advent is also about a pregnant, expecting mother. And so, only during that first Advent, it was so unique, such a unique event, only during that first Advent could you have the virgin bride and the expectant mother be the same person. And so Mary is the one who steals the show of Advent. And rightfully so. She is the one who kind of gets put into relief. The virgin mother. The virgin mother Mary. Now that we are only a week away from Christmas, the prayer before the Eucharistic prayer, so right, right before we're about to enter into the you are indeed holy, Lord, the fount of all holiness, make holy therefore these gifts, or whatever the Eucharistic prayer is, we have a preface. So every, every Mass you have something that prefaces the Eucharistic prayer, and it's called a preface. And, and the prefaces, are they're, they're different according to the season, to the time. Well, when, it, when we get to December 17th, the preface changes. And it's no longer so much about Christ's second coming, but it, it talks uh, really deeply and profoundly about his first coming in a really beautiful and attractive way. It's kind of a real compelling way that God, that I'm sorry, that the preface presents that first advent, that mysterious advent with the virgin mother. And it's a short little phrase, but it hits me every time. And I'll say it in Latin, and then I'll say what we usually trans what it's translated into into English. Virgo mater ineffabili delixione sustenuit. Virgo mater, the virgin mother, ineffabili, ineffable, delixione, love. So the translation that we typically have, or that, that we have in the English Missal, is 
the virgin mother longed, with him, longed for him with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sang of his coming. That's how, how it, it's outlined in the preface. The virgin mother lo- longed for him with love beyond all telling. So ineffabili, translated here beyond all telling, is really the word ineffable. You can't communicate it. It's too profound. It, it's, it's inexpressible. The ineffable love that Mary had. And this word sustenuit, now this is interesting to me because it's, it's different. So we translate it longed, longed. But really, in Latin, it means to sustain or to support or to hold back. All of those are kind of mysteriously interwoven into that word. So when it says that the virgin mother sustained him, the virgin mother supported him with love ineffable, the virgin mother held him back with love ineffable. All of those are kind of wrapped up in that word in the Latin, and so we don't really get it in the English. Longed for is certainly a, a significant word, a significant way of expressing it, but this, to sustenuit, to sustain, to support, or to hold back. And this is the picture that I want to present of our Blessed Mother. She is sustaining the Son of God. That's what mothers do when babies are in their womb, and even throughout the rest of their lives. They can't help it. She is sustaining the Son of God with ineffable love. That's how she sustains him. She's also holding him back from permeating the world until the right time. She's keeping him. She's pregnant with this suspense, with this intensity, holding him until the right time. And this is such a beautiful way to think about Mary, that Mary is so full of restraint, and yet at the same time, so full of intense, ineffable love. It it becomes a sign of contradiction to us. It becomes an image that is ineffable, And this is so significant, so rich in meaning and and, and significance and intensity and suspense. And it has all this ineffable love, yet with the most unassuming appearance. That in this little, little virgin mother contained the God of heaven and earth and yet seemed so simple and lowly. And this is the picture that we get drawn of Mary that's kind of woven into the Eucharistic liturgy, the liturgy of the Eucharist, that Mary is sustaining him with this ineffable love. So I'm going to have three images as I go through this talk, to kind of highlight what, uh, give us some images to reflect upon the Virgin Mother, to reflect upon her during the season of Advent. So, so we have Mary exalted. We, we think of Mary exalted. These are not my images, by the way. We think of Mary exalted as like Our Lady Prompt Sucker. You can't see her right now. Um, you know, this, she's dressed in all gold, big old crown. You know, baby Jesus is holding the world, and it's a sign of victory. She's made it. She's in glory. She's glorified. And then, of course, we have that, that afflicted woman, the fourth station. Jesus meets his afflicted mother, Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady at the foot of the cross. This image of Mary bearing the weight of sin and, and, and suffering with her son. So this is another image of Mary. Both of these are extraordinarily significant. But the image that we're having today 
is the image of Advent Mary, of the virgin mother, the expectant mother. And all that mystery, the mystery of Mary at the foot of the cross, and the mystery of Mary glorified is within the Advent Mary. All that intensity, all that, that ineffable love is present there in the little Advent Mary. But it's so concealed. It's not fully broken open. It's not fully revealed. And so the little Advent Mary becomes uh, an image pregnant with significance and yet so utterly mysterious. And so my first image that I would like to give of the blessed, the little Advent Mary is Mary's virginal blush, that this, for Mary, is her disposition, her littleness. And I remember reading in, in our novitiate, uh, when, I was, when I was in my novitiate, I had a, we had a book, and one of the things it was talking about uh, was about how oftentimes, you know, as religious, we're presented with things that may not be, you know, the most you know, uh, pure or whatever, you know, just in the world or whatever, you get presented with these things. And, and it said in this book, it is a strength of the religious to blush. And that always struck me because I was like, that's so embarrassing. Nobody wants to blush, you know, whenever you, you know. Uh, and, but there's something about Mary blushing that is, that drew down God from heaven into her womb that was so attractive to God that it was so simple so pure that Mary could just blush in the midst this little sinless woman in the midst of a sinful world blushing and and God comes down into the depths of her body and when the angel it says that the angel appeared to her it says that Mary was startled by his greeting and pondered what sort of greeting this might mean. She was afraid and caught off guard. She was taken aback. And so I think it's the perfect image of thinking of what Mary did. She probably blushed. She was probably like, oh my gosh, what, you talking to me? You know, that kind of surprise. She was startled, caught off guard, embarrassed. You know, she wasn't not expecting, you know, she wasn't ready for an angel to appear to her. You know, maybe her veil wasn't on right. You know, um, she was just totally caught off guard. Sister, yeah, veil was ever on wrong. <laughs> um, and so, but there's a, there's a cool thing about this idea of blushing. The blushing is indicative of a transformation. It's kind of revealing a hidden, mysterious transformation. So let me explain what I mean. So Fulton Sheen, he talks about that when the waters of Cana saw their God, saw their creator, they blushed and became wine. That was Fulton Sheen's expression. That the waters miraculously became wine. The waters were transformed into something utterly new utterly rich in significance and now it's miraculous and that wine was going to be, take on the same significance of Christ's blood and of course Mary was present at that miracle bringing it about it was her prayer and so so in a real sense Mary this pure virginal water is brought before the Lord the angel appears to her and she blushes out of humility, out of a certain sense of embarrassment. And that transforms her into the mother of God. What I'm saying is that her, her blush was a disposition of humility, a disposition to receive divinity and yet maintain virginity, a disposition to recognize her lowliness and yet have the confidence to say yes 
What a powerful little woman she was, that little Advent Mary. And so the O Antiphon today, so I don't know if Father talked about the O Antiphons, but when we go to December, from December 17th to December 23rd, we start singing O Antiphons in our liturgy in different places, in the Alleluia verse or in the, in the um, evening prayer in the Vespers. And each one is talking about a different title of our Lord. And it gets more and more specific as we go along. But today's, December 18th, is O Adonai. O, it's referencing the divine name, Yahweh. It's, it's indicating that. Adonai is the Hebrew translation of Lord, which is what they would say instead of saying the divine name. But anyway, he says... It, the, in, the, in that O Antiphon, it says, O Adonai, qui moiisi inine flame rubi aparuisti. It says, O Lord, Lord Yahweh, who to Moses appeared in that burning, in that bush burning. And on the, on the feast day of Mary, Mother of God, what is said. It says, Mary, your blessed and fruitful virginity is like the bush, flaming yet unburned, which Moses saw on Sinai. So Mary's virginity is not just this little prudishness. It's, it's on fire, like, like the bush that revealed the divine name. Her virginity and yet not consumed. It's maintained. Her virginity is maintained throughout her life. And so that is the image that we get of this little Virgin Mary, of this little Advent Mary, burning with this ineffable love, this intense love, and yet the restraint to have it never be consumed. This is the intensity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so, in that burning bush, that was where the divine name was revealed to Moses for the first time. And that was an intense moment in Israel's history. It's really the climax of the, the Pentateuch. It's really the climax of God's revelation. He reveals himself, and by saying his name, he allows Israel to call upon him personally. And so... It is in the, the womb, that, that virginity that, that burnt, that's flaming yet unburned of Mary, that we get revealed God with a face. And so it's, it's parallel, that, that the burning bush revealing God's divine name, and then Jesus, the new divine name, the divine name with a face, with fingernails, with earwax, with everything it means to be human, that is revealed because of Mary's intense, ineffable, and yet restrained love. It's a powerful image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And Mary becomes the model of the humble yet bold response to God. And that's what I feel like, that's why I'm trying to capture with, with this image of Mary blushing, is because it has, it shows that she is both humble, yet fearless, intense. She is not just this, this little sissy, effeminate woman. She is a serious woman. She was taking the whole weight of divinity on her shoulders. And she knew it. And yet, she is able to say yes, not because she believes in herself, but because she intensely loves and has confidence in God. St. Therese ended her, her diary. It says that, uh, that the end of her diary, the story of a soul, you know, her famous work, that there's lines of her pen because she kept passing out, but she kept writing. And, they, and I remember the, the epilogue says, 
says this is a perfect description of that intense little girl. <laughs> she was intense. And at the end of her story of a soul, it just, it's an unfinished sentence. It says, in love and confidence, and then it trails off. What an intense way to understand Mary. And in love and in confidence. And yet, we don't just put Mary on this pedestal. And that's why I like the image of her blushing. Because that's something that's so close to us. That's something that we're not afraid of. Of a little girl blushing. And yet, there's a certain amount of fear and trembling with that, that purity that she exudes. But she invites us, by becoming the mother of Christ, to become her own children. She invites us into the mystery by her humility and also by our confidence. And so, Mary is the reason why we're able to have a close relationship with God. Why we're able to call Jesus, Jesus. Why we're able to gaze upon his face. We can cry out with Jesus, Abba, Father, because we have first cried out, Mama, Mary. And Mary gives us the opportunity to enter into that mystery because of her little meekness, her little loneliness, and that intense, ineffable love that she held within her. And so she invites us into the mystery and allows us to call God Father, something we've never deserved. Mary has a precise place in the plan of salvation history. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, under the law, to ransom those under the law, so that we might receive a spirit of adoption. And as proof that we are children, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts that we might cry out, Abba, Father. So we are no longer slaves, but rather a child, and if a child, then an heir to the kingdom of God. St. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, is making a direct reference to the woman in Genesis 3.15, who God promised would come with her offspring to crush the head of the serpent and reunite a broken human family under one universal covenant sealed by the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mary, the mother of God, the church, and all of humanity longs to aid all her spiritual children in their journey toward holiness and heaven. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Catechetical Corner. And join us next time as Father John Joseph concludes sharing these spiritual insights about the Blessed Mother. God love you, and we'll see you next time.